In this episode, I'm with Cameron Harold, the GOAT of being the second in command. Everyone talks about culture. Culture comes from being a little bit more than a business, a little bit less than a religion, and kind of being in that zone of a cult in between. The okay. 11 traits that describe the typical entrepreneur. Those <laughs> traits, by the way, as you count it up, are actually, they are, they are traits of entrepreneurs, but they're the clinical diagnosed traits that the medical community uses to diagnose bipolar disorder. I don't try to motivate people. I hire motivated people. Elon Musk did this publicly about three months ago. He went out and said, if you're in a bad meeting, walk away from it. I sent him a text. I'm like, no, you don't walk away from it. You're not fixing the root problem. If they just walk out of bad meetings, you're not fixing the problem. Fix the meetings and they don't have to walk out of them. Right. It's like saying, if you're in a Tesla and it goes skidding off the road, just don't drive in the Tesla. You wouldn't do that. You'd fix the Tesla. <laughs> right. Fix right. the meetings. Everyone wants to be great, but only few actually get there. And I'm on a mission to find out what all the greatest have in common. I've traveled tirelessly to find, sit down, and talk with GOATs. People that are arguably the greatest of all time at what they do. Sales, marketing, advertising, business, podcasts, branding, you name it. The way they do things may be different, but they all seem to see the world the same way. To them, success is not only achievable, but inevitable. And we'll get inside their heads as they share their expertise with me each week. My name's Mike Arce, and this is The Goat Show. This episode is sponsored by Loud Rumor. If you own a fitness studio, crowd therapy, or massage business, there is no company in the industry better at generating high quality leads than Loud Rumor. In just the last two years, Loud Rumor has worked with nearly 1,000 fitness and wellness companies and won ranking Arizona's Ad Agency of the Year in 2017. Getting more paying members in the door can be tough. Let Loud Rumor do the heavy lifting and get new people in your doors every day. Go to loudrumor.com and learn more. Also sponsored by Agency GSD. Starting a digital agency was definitely one of the best decisions I've ever made. Building it, however, was a lot more challenging than I expected. I always wish someone just gave me a roadmap that I could follow and just let me be a fly on the wall at the successful agencies out there so I could really see how it's done. Agency GSD allows you to do just that. Stop playing small and visit agencygsd.com to learn how to help hundreds of clients get it to seven figures and be extremely profitable along the way. Again, go to agencygsd.com. What's up, everybody? I'm Mike Garcia, and welcome back to another episode of The Goat Show, where we interview people that are arguably the greatest of all time at what they do. And today, I am here with Cameron Harold, the goat of being the second in command. Cameron, welcome hey, to Mike. The Goat Show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Man, I'm so excited. At you. I've been wanting to meet with you almost a year now. Yeah. Because I think the first time I met you face to face was at Thrive, which was um, it'll be a year like this week, year I this think, week. right? Yeah, we're, we're, you're going to Thrive again? Yeah, I'll be there just for Saturday is the only time I can make it. Okay. This year, but I'll so, be there. so I'll be there for that. Yeah. Um, so, guys, everybody watching and listening, just so you know, we're going to dive into some amazing stuff that you don't typically get in other podcasts. Every podcast that I listen to, every inspirational video that I watch for business, Every, every snippet that you hear out there, it's always for the entrepreneur, about vision, about creating, about having no fear, about doing stuff regardless of failure, all that, and that's amazing stuff. We get it, but we're saturated with it. The stuff that we don't get is the stuff that we need, which is the stuff for the number two guy, the operations, the one that makes sure that all your ideas, or at least a fraction of ones, right, at least the best ones, mm -hmm. actually get executed the way they're supposed to, on time, the right way right? And um, you've got an incredible story. So I want to dive into why you are the absolute best at helping people become elite second in commands, how you understand CEOs and why you understand CEOs. Um, I also want to dive into your background, like what you did. Sure. And then just a lot of the cool stuff that you have going on, because I think what you're doing is brilliant because you are creating content. It's like the whole blue ocean thing. You're yep. creating content for something that nobody's creating content for, yet I feel like is as important as the number one guy. Yep. Okay. <laughs> where, do, where do we want to start? Man, I, right? So let's start with you, Cameron. With, with the how or why I got here? Or? Let's, let's start with the story that I think people, a lot of people know you, and I think everyone knows the 1-800-GOT-JUNK deal. Sure. Like what happened there? Because I think that's kind of where this whole, um, like, 
brand around you started to come out, right? It started a little bit before, but that was probably where it exploded. So okay. I was, I think what makes me interesting as understanding the COO as well as the CEO is I am an entrepreneur. I okay. was groomed as an entrepreneur. I did a TED talk years ago um, that's on the main TED website as raising kids as entrepreneurs. And so I was literally groomed to be an entrepreneur. I've been growing entrepreneurs. I've been coaching entrepreneurs. Um, in fact, Kimball Musk, I coached him back in 1993, and his cousin Peter Reeve, who built Solar City, I coached him in 1993. This is Elon's brother. Elon's brother, yeah. Right. So they were both franchisees of mine at College Pro Painters 25 years ago. So I've been coaching entrepreneurs now for 27 years. So I've been in the coaching of entrepreneurs space, and I've been in entrepreneur space, but in the classic business world, for three times, I played the second in command. So even though I had a lot of the entrepreneurial traits and a lot of the entrepreneurial skills, when we built out Boyd Auto Body and Gerber Auto Collision, I was the second in command. When we built out College Pro Painters, I was effectively second in command running west coast of, of the United States. Um, when we built 1-800-GOT-JUNK, I was the chief operating officer. My best friend Brian was the CEO. So three times, and that really spanned a total of uh, seven, four, uh, 18 years. Wow. So, yeah, a total of 18 years I played the second in command role. So when you think about me being very entrepreneurial, but being in that second in command seat, I really understand the role, the dynamics, um, how the relationships have to work. And, and so that's really when I started coaching entrepreneurs. I left 1-800-GOT-JUNK 11 years ago. So in that last 11 years, I've been truly coaching real businesses. There's a lot of kind of coaches that coach the entrepreneurs or the right, home-based right. real businesses. But and when you say real businesses, define that for me. Mine need like a, you know, 20, 25 employees minimum before I start talking to them. I've coached the second in command at Sprint. Okay. I coached the CEO of Sprint. I coached a monarchy in the Middle East. Wow. Um, I coach guys at grasshopper.com, eye contact. And they've blown Media up. Temple, I think, did they just up. sell yeah, Grasshopper? They, they, yeah, for, for well over six figures. Yeah. Uh, for, so no, well nine figures. Figures. Yeah, they were, they were over 100 million. Seven or nine? Yeah, it was over 100 nine. million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I take wow. three zeros off in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I've actually coached three companies that have sold for over 100 million. Okay. Um, but so that's really my zone is working with the CEO and the COO and their leadership teams mm -hmm. and giving them the skills and the tools to grow. Okay, awesome. Now, talk to me about the. Like, what was it at 1-800-GOT-JUNK that you were able to accomplish from the time that you got there to the yeah. time that you, you had left? Well, there were, there were three core things. So I walked into 1-800-GOT-JUNK in October 2000. Okay. There were 14 employees at the head office when I got there. In fact, I was employee 14. Um, when I left, six and a half years later, we had 3,100 employees system-wide. We were operating in 330 cities. We went from 2 million to 106 million in six years. Twice ranked number one to work for in British Columbia and once ranked number two to work for in Canada. Wow. So we were literally one of the biggest, hottest brands in the country, along with Lululemon, the Vancouver Olympics, and Intrawest that owned Whistler. Those were the four companies you wanted to work for on the West Coast. Wow. So I got known for building that. The reason that, that it did well was the three core things. The first thing is that it was pretty much on day one when I got there, I said, we really have to raise our prices. And everyone said, no, we can't. We're already struggling to, to attract people. And I said, well, here's the deal. We're gonna increase our prices 50%, 50%, but we're gonna be the premium. We're gonna be kind of like the, the Starbucks. Like it's ridiculous that we pay 550 for a coffee, right. right? But because we pay 550 for coffee, they can have better staff, they can have good service, they can have good product. Hell, you go to like a really great kind of independent coffee place, you're paying six bucks for a latte now, mm -hmm. and their staff's even better, right? So you, we charged a premium. Second thing was we focused on a cult. Everyone talks about culture, Culture comes from being a little bit more than a business, a little bit less than a religion, and kind of being in that zone of a cult in between. So I tried to create that cult, where that's like stuff up on the wall, mantras, sayings, um, you know, anything that becomes kind of like creating, creating habits, um, only hiring high culture people, and then getting rid of all the toxic people. Most companies don't do that. And then the third was PR, was how much free press can we generate for the business? Because no one believes advertising and marketing as much as they believe PR. Yes, you have to advertise. Yes, you have to do marketing. But if you can also lever that up with, with free press. So we actually understood how to generate free PR. We landed 5,200 stories that were all independent single stories. And, and there was nowhere to share it. If we had Facebook when I was there, shit, we could have blown up. Mm -hmm. Like, well, we did blow up. But like, imagine what we really could have grown to if we could have shared all that press on social feeds. So I, I want to talk about the free PR. I put a note here because I want to get to it. Sure. And we will get to it. And th but those were the three concrete things for sure that we did. 
starting day one. Well, what were, what were the numbers? How many, you had 16 employees when you had started? 14. 14 employees, yeah. and then? There were six VPs, six people in the call center, Brian and myself. Okay, and then, and then how many years were you there? Six and a half. Six and a half years, yeah. and on that day that you had gone, and how many employees? We doubled our revenue six consecutive years in a row. Doubled it six years in a yeah. row. That's like crazy when you had, think about that, right? Had we been right? a U.S. company, because we were based in Canada, we didn't qualify, but we would have been the number one on the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies two years in a row. Wow. At, at our peak, though. How many employees not did any, you have? Like, at our peak, we would have been, because we were 17,000% growth. 17,000%? Yeah. over five years. You can't, like, that's a number that people can't even calculate it. Right. Slowly, yeah. When I did because my first they, book, they double, haven't come. Yeah, I, I wanted to teach people how to double their revenue and double their profit in three years or less. We doubled our revenue and profit six consecutive times, six years in a row. It's not really. It doesn't happen very often. No, no. But especially it's gonna... without taking on any debt. Like we didn't borrow money and we gave up no equity. So to do that is a that's the cult. You know what I'm excited about is I'm going to ask you all the questions to learn how I'm going to do that in my sure. business this year. Yeah. I'm so excited. Guys, you like that? We're going to double our revenue and profit six years in a row. Live coaching sessions. (laughs) Live coaching sessions. Okay. So you started with uh, 14 employees, uh, six and a half years later, how many employees you had with all that growth? 3,100. 3,100 employees. I mean, you're talking now, it's not even the same company. Yeah, we were operating in the UK, Australia, the US and Canada, 46 states, nine nine provinces. Wow. Okay. All right. So 248 people at the head office. (laughs) That's great. Real okay, deal. so for for all you guys listening right now, the, he's he's becoming the real deal. If you didn't know who he was, right? You're like, okay, maybe this guy's worth paying attention to. But before I get you hooked on who he is, let me prove that he knows who you are. So you've got the CEO list on your phone. Do you have it accessible again? Yeah, you can the, pull it up. The list of so guys, are, while he fi- pulls it up, I'm going to set this, this up for you so you know. The traits of entrepreneurs. The right? traits of entrepreneurs. Yeah. So this is important in order to really make sure that. Um, you can succeed. You've got to know who you are. And it's important for your team to know who you are as well. Because once you know your traits and your tendencies, um, your team can work a little better with you. So, so describe the audience right now. All those entrepreneurs sure. that are listening right now, I want you guys that are listening, take note. Notch in your head, is this me? Put your thumb up. Is it me? Index finger. Just keep counting until all your fingers are up. How many fingers could they put up max? Yeah, so a maximum of 11 times. So I'm going to give okay. you 11 traits that describe the typical entrepreneur. Okay. And when, when one of those traits describe you, count one. When you get to two, count two. Count up how many of these 11 traits describe you as an entrepreneur. Um, and then at the end, I'll give you kind of the rest of the story. And there's 11. So if you need to use a toe, there you go. use a toe. So are you filled with energy? Does your mind get flooded with ideas? Are you driven? Are you restless? Are you unable to keep still? Do you often work on little sleep? Do you get euphoric? Do you get easily irritated by minor obstacles? Do you burn out periodically? Do you act out sexually? And do you feel persecuted by those who do not accept your vision? So I have 11 of those 11 traits. Yeah, and my team, we did this in front of my team before the interview, and like my whole team was in a circle. And they, they had, I think the highest guy there was like eight, right? But what would you say about yourself? Where would you rank yourself? I would say, um, I would say I'm, I'm, I believe I'm all of them. I think my team didn't count all 11. Yeah. Uh, because I think I've learned so how to... Temper a couple maybe? I, I, can, I can control the behavior in certain things. Okay. Because I've, I've learned about myself. So you're approaching 11, if not 11, but they, the whole team... I've been 11 at one right? point publicly. Yeah, so those, yeah. So the, yeah right? So, so those <laughs> traits, by the way, as you count it up, are actually... They are, they are traits of entrepreneurs, but they're the clinical diagnosed traits that the medical community uses to diagnose bipolar disorder. So, and you heard me right, that those are the traits of bipolar disorder. And what that means is, according to the medical community, if you say yes to five of those traits you would be clinically diagnosed as bipolar. If you're in the nine to 11 zone, (laughs) you might actually be medicated for some of those signs of bipolar. Now, I don't think we should be medicated for this because I think it's part of our superpower as an entrepreneur. Sure. Our mania, our excitement, our energy, and our drive is why people follow us, right? The stress and depression is simply us course correcting. The, the flirting, this, the acting out sexually is our, is our desperate need for acceptance and for, for praise. And it's this, and that's why we keep doing, that's why we have a brand. It's why we associate our name with, we're starving for something we didn't get in the school system. Right. You know, we were, most, most entrepreneurs were beat up in school for 18 years and told that we were screw ups and that we were never going to succeed and we were a C minus student, right? So we're starving for that praise that fundamentally the system gave us. Now there's normal humans who don't have normal jobs or have normal jobs that have some of these traits, but the medical community calls the CEO or calls bipolar disorder the CEO disease. We're just bred differently. 
And because we have all the pressure, let's say, and, and I know you've done this, um, you've hired someone for sure at some point where you also weren't sure if you could meet payroll that month. Oh, like several right? months in a row. So, so I've had times <laughs> where I literally would go out and make a business decision that's pretty risky and mm -hmm. also be scared about actually paying taxes. Um, I didn't pay payroll taxes for about seven months in a row and had to pay a lot because of that in yeah. fees so, to do that. So the normal person doesn't do that, right? So we have all right. this stress and we can't tell our employees. Like you're not going to walk into your office and say to your employees, by the way, I'm not sure we can meet payroll. Let's see if we can get that marketing going, right? right. So we don't say anything. We don't tell our spouse. We don't tell our friends. We don't really even often tell our peers. So we live in this pressure cooker and that's what magnifies the stress. Um, but what's interesting, two of the three founders of Netscape were bipolar. Richard Branson, bipolar. Steve Jobs, hypomanic. Um, Elon Musk, bipolar. When you go outside of the spectrum of what people think is normal, that entrepreneurs aren't normal. Nor are we supposed to be. Only 3% of the population should be an entrepreneur. 97% of the population should be working for them. Right? Well, 3% of the population gets diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So let's talk so about the 97%. It's not a disease, maybe it's not a disease. Maybe it's exactly who we are. Yeah. That's, that's my point with this is, and with attention deficit disorder, same thing. Maybe these are our strengths, not a disease after all. Maybe we're not supposed to be like teachers and doctors. Right, right. Well, it's kind of like when you, when you look at certain people that have like a high functioning autism. Right. Uh, but meanwhile, that, that actually allows them to do things that the average person is just not able to do or look at things the way the average person is not able to see them. So if, if, you, if you look at Elon Musk and really study him, and I've known him for, for uh, 22 years now, if you really, there's, there's no way you couldn't possibly see him as an artistic savant. Yeah, no. Nope. We want him to be normal because we look up and then all of a sudden we go, but he's not, so we try to make sense of it in our mind. He, he's not a problem. He's f***ing brilliant. Oh my gosh. And he's exactly he's... who he's supposed to be. He needs to unplug a little bit right now and take a vacation and de-stress a little bit, but he is a savant. So, so really quick, quick tangent on that. And that's why he thinks different. That's why he talks different. That's why people can, can they can't quite associate. He, he also, what I've learned, because we were talking about the Joe Rogan. He was just on the interview yeah. with Joe Rogan. Did you notice that he will take a good five to seven uncomfortable seconds to answer some good questions? You know, whereas uh, most other people, like, they, they already, they're waiting for the guy to finish. They already know what the question is halfway through the, the question. Well, well, most entrepreneurs don't wait because we're on the spectrum for Tourette's as well. Those are the three yeah. traits of entrepreneurs. <laughs> Tourette's, so if you're on the spectrum for Tourette's is thinking out loud. So, uh, so the autism side is what slows him down and he's in his head and he's processing. He's like a, he's like a very thoughtful computer. Right. Sometimes people process to be calculated. He's not being calculated. He just, he's disassociated from the kind of the group that he's in and he's just in his head processing. So yeah, he slows it down. Wow, okay, so what, what were your overall thoughts on that interview and Elon Musk and where he's at today? I'm, I'm starving for those conversations mm -hmm. because we talk about all the shit that doesn't matter. I, like, I don't, I don't wanna hear about the Kardashians. I don't care about some sports right. team. I really don't care about the politics or the government or news or some hurricane, like who gives a fuck? A hurricane on the east coast of the United States, it's not going to affect me. Right, right. So why am I thinking about it, right? right? But I wanna know about AI. I want to understand how it's actually impacting us. The thought that we are actually cyborgs right now. We are cyborgs. Carrying a phone gives us the power to answer every single question that's ever been right. asked. That wasn't possible 20 years ago, 15 years ago. We have so much, like, this is starting to embed inside of us, right? Um, and that's the, that's the idea of Neuralink, right? right? Well, so the, yes, the Neuralink and also, so the whole idea with singularity is that our, our role as humans in civilization is to, to continue to procreate, to, to survive. So we have to kill off anything that will threaten us. We kill off the tigers, we kill off the bears, we, we kill off the wolves so that we can survive, right? We get rid of anybody who's gonna kill our tribes so that we build houses and fences and security so we can survive. Now, if we build computers to be smarter than humans, at some point the, the computers can think for themselves. They recently started to create their own languages. They had to kill a couple off because they were creating a language humans didn't understand. Um, they were, one of them was like creating war scenarios, so they killed that computer off. But if a computer's job is to become, or we build this AI robotics that becomes smarter than humans, at some point they learn that their role is to protect themselves against anything that can hurt them, we, we become the lions and tigers and bears and wolves to the computer. So yeah, we could, so we could be creating that. I, I agree, but also I kind of want to like add a second perspective to this. Yeah. So. If we're, if we're creating machine, like the idea is humans become second in command if the computers Correct. take over, right? Correct. We become number two in this Correct. world. Yep. But if I'm going to become number two in the world, if I'm going to do that, I mean, that, if, 
if that is a perfect leader, if we're able to design a perfect, clear yep. thinking leader, yep. is that good? I mean, if you know, so so think about it this way: if it it's might, it might be if number one decides to keep us around, but well, why wouldn't they? Because our because if we become a threat to them, if they all of a sudden perceive or worry, it's kind of like is it if, if we well, become on, a threat or we, certain we of any, us become threats? Do, right? Do we know any government official who's maybe like making decisions that are a little scary right now? Uh, yeah. So what if a computer does that? Yeah, but here's the difference between him and the computer: the he is an emotional reactor, like. His computers, ideas and com thoughts. Computers could build emotions. They could build emotions, but they build emotions around calculative. Okay. So here's, like the, here's, the best case. Like, here's what you ask, because this, <coughs> this is like hours and hours of amazing discussion. Mm -hmm. But that's what I liked about that podcast. Mm -hmm. Was was that's that's a dinner discussion? Is this shit? Of course, right? He's sparking. N not what the Kardashians' thought. Instagram photo was. Right. And and he's the only he, he not is the only, but that's. The reason I go to the main TED conference every year, the reason I go to Burning Man, the reason I'm in four different masterminds is to have these, this level of discussions around autonomous vehicles, around disease, around the spread of, of um, countries, around, around you know, where are we heading with the future, around why are we going to procreating Mars. Those are interesting discussions. Of course. Um, I go to the main TED conference every year and in five days I watch 123 live TED talks. Wow. You can't walk out of there without your mind being completely blown apart. No. You know, for a two-year period, I watched two TED Talks every morning. Did you? Okay. That was like a part of my routine. What's I watched two. My favorite TED Talk? Yeah. I think a lot of people like the Simon Sinek yeah. one. The Simon you Sinek know, Simon one. Simon used to work for us. Really? So Simon met me. Simon flew out to, to Vancouver in 2003 to meet me because he read about me in Fortune magazine. And he flew from New York City to Vancouver to meet Brian and I. We met. At the time, he didn't have the golden circle. It was a cone, and he drew it up on our whiteboard and was describing the cone. So like from the top down, you would see, you would see, yeah, from the top down, you'd see circles, but from the, from the side view, you'd see layers of a cone. We went for lunch. We ended up hiring him to do our marketing and our rebranding for 1-800-GOT-JUNK, and then we had him on our board for a year and a half. And then three weeks later, in around 2009, he did his TEDx talk. Wow. So yeah, I've known Simon for a long, he's stayed at my house. We've been, like, known him for a long, long time. He's great. I've been dying to get him on the show. So if you know him, yeah, well, we've been no, dying no. to get him on the show. Because he inspired a lot of what Loud Rumor had become and started to become around 2015. Yeah. Um, so we read Starts With Why, we read Great uh, Leaders Eat Last. Um, I, I went back to that 18 minute video, which if you watch the video, I mean, it's good to get the book too for other sets of context, but the it's video strong. is so it's great. Strong. He did yeah, such I a great job. I think the video is all you need. Yeah, it's great. And um, so yeah, he's awesome. Okay, so I want to yeah. go into a couple things here. Um, I want to talk about your TED Talk. Um, that's interesting. But before I get into that, um, you were talking about getting free PR. Yeah. And here's the reason I want to dive into that is because I think the world's starting to get lazy. I'm guilty of it. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by getting lazy, my dad owned a Gold's Gym back in the 90s. Okay. And when my dad owned a business in the 90s, he wasn't talking about conversion campaigns, right. lead gen campaigns. Right. It was just about how can, the, how can the community know who I am, what we do, where we do it, why we're the best, how can I get out there? So he's doing everything he can, you know, the easy PR stuff or the easy branding and awareness stuff where he's like sponsoring little league teams sure. and like he's sponsoring events and he's in the community. He was never able to, my, my dad is a um, self-employed man, yeah. but he is not an entrepreneur. Okay. There's a difference because my dad is, wouldn't fall for most of those traits. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, now I think with like internet and funnels and all this stuff, which is brilliant and I use them and it's great. I think people started forgetting that like the greats, the people that we see, the Bill Gates of the world, the Steve Jobs of the world, the Richard Branson of the world, they've really been able to make a splash, not because of a funnel. They made a splash because of a story or several stories, several stories or several a consecutive stories. string of them yep. that seemed detached, but in reality, they were all together, right? Yep. The reason we propose with a diamond ring is because of PR. Sure. The diamond has nothing to do with anything that the religion and marriage, marriage isn't even tied to religion, oh. but it's now become a religious thing. And, and the, we spend so much money on weddings and that's not important. So, you know, there's so many things. If you ever watch this show called, um, this is somebody ruins everything. Andy ruins everything or something like that, but it's this YouTube thing and he takes things like Christmas. And it's like, just so you know, this is really how Christmas started and he breaks awesome. it down. So it's pretty interesting. And uh, he broke down a lot of stuff. And then you just realize that most of what we think of the world, like, you know, not anymore, but in the 90s, yeah. remember milk? What, what did PR's, milk mean to so us in the 90s? Marketing. 
Yeah, what was milk in the 90s to you? Vitamin D. Vitamin D does the body Healthy good, bones. strong bones, yeah. right? Makes your teeth white. It's great for you. Athletes had mustaches. Yeah, and it's all shit. It's all not true. It's all not true. Yeah. But so. you will believe, like what you said with coffee, right? Coffee enthusiasts will tell you that Starbucks is not the best coffee. It's not. It's terrible. Professional runners will tell you Nike's not the best running shoe, not even close. Yeah. But the world believes it because marketing and PR has done such a great job. Well, I think so. Marketing is one side that you have to be doing, right? right? But what's interesting, and Simon actually told me this, Simon Sinek, there's the old story of like an, a company has to spend 10% of their revenue on marketing. And then Simon showed me that there's not a single advertising agency on the planet that has ever spent more than six. Oh, we spend a lot more than six. Do you, like, do oh, yeah. Really, we, right? spend, we spend probably 20. On your own business. Oh, we have a table, just salary alone. We have an entire table of six people that just run ads for us and okay. just do stuff for us. And, um, and so, yeah, just. So then, then I think that's the opportunity as well, right? Is okay. one, one thing is, is an opportunity with it. Another one is, geez, it's kind of interesting. But PR is something that people believe that if you get us, so we were on Oprah. So with 1 800 Got Junk, we were on Oprah, we were on CNN, oh, wow. we were on Squawk Box. Like, name it. We were on everything except Letterman. 17 times on Dr. Phil. Um, 17 times? What, yeah. what are you doing? Oh, this is before Dr. Years. Phil became who Dr. Phil yeah, we're is on a today. Dr. Phil show. No, it was on, a sh on his show. What were you guys talking about on Dr. Phil? Oh, like cleaning people's stuff up and, and the pack rat story. and The pack rat all, story. Yeah, all that same stuff. But okay. So, you, so what, what we figured out was every single day, every journalist wakes, wakes up, sits down at their desk and thinks, what the hell am I going to write about today? Mm -hmm. And they literally sit there and go, I need a story. I need to be inspired. So they go online, they get sucked into Facebook, they wait for a, for a newswire to come over, they wait for their editor to give them something. But imagine having to come, come up with a new story idea every single day. So what we do is we avoid the email, we avoid the news desk, we avoid the city desk, we avoid press releases, and we pick up the phone and we call them. Now how many phone calls a day do you think a writer gets? Tons. Maybe five. Really? Because Wait, a writer or a the writer, person you're wanting to get in front a writer. of? Like, no, the actual okay. journalist. So we the call actual a journalist. journalist. Okay. Now, if you call a journalist, you go, hey, Bob, it's Cameron calling. I think I have a good story for you. Do you have two minutes? He goes, Cameron who? He goes, I'm calling from you know, the COO Alliance. I think I have a good story. Do you have two minutes? He goes, sure, what is it? Because he has two minutes. If he doesn't, he'll say, I'm on a deadline. You go, great, how about I call you tomorrow or Friday? Right. You're going to get past the gatekeeper. No one phones anybody. How about photographers? You know that when you have, see a story, any newspaper, magazine, blog, it has the photo, it has the person's name who took the photo right beside it? Yeah. How many times do you think that photographer ever gets a uh, phone call? Right. And you it's can his get his mom. info. The phone will ring, he'll be like, oh, it's not my mom, my mom, who I wonder who it is. Right. So you just go, hey, I think I have a good photo op for you. Do you have two minutes? So go, sure, what is it? You tell the journalist or the photographer the story idea, give them five quick bullet points. They'll get excited, they'll ask questions, you can ask questions and listen, they frame it. They go to their editor and say, I think I have a good story. The editor goes, great, go write it, because I have 400 emails to say no to. That's the whole thing. I have a book on this called Free PR coming out in November. Um, and I'm actually co-authoring it with one of my former clients who own DNA11 and Canvas Pop, which are some big, big uh, digital brands. The ability to get free PR is so simple, but no one will pick up the phone Everyone thinks it's investigative well, What do you journalism. say when you get on the phone? That's the, I think the hey, thing is- Hey, do you is, have two minutes? I think I have a good story for you. Well, I get that. Like, I, I, I have the guts to do that. Okay. I'm just wondering, do I have the thing to say after? That's right. gonna get her so to say- So every company has good. five stories. Okay. okay. So let's think about yours for a second. How did you start your brand? <laughs> what were you doing before? I was, well, initially I was a personal trainer for seven years, and then after that I was running a sales floor. Okay, so you were in a boring running a sales floor job mm -hmm. to running your own business, mm -hmm. right? Or you were a personal trainer to being in the personal training space. There's a story about that, right? It's, it's called the, um, the hero's journey. Right. right. The hero's journey is something that we all are on, right? Every one of us has struggled, we battle with boredom, we want to do something different. You tell that story, you talk about the highs and the lows, that's a story, okay? okay? What's your culture like in your company? Um, well, we definitely like to have fun. No, no, your culture is amazing. I yeah. walked in the door <laughs> and I was vibrating. Like, by the way, if you're ever in Scottsdale, Arizona, you got to come in and visit. I'm sure they'll let you in to come in and visit. Drop into the, to their neighboring company as well, um, <laughs> Redirect Health. You guys have, both of you, great cultures. But when you walk in your door and then you look into that boardroom with like the post-it notes, like 2,000, 4,000 post-it notes of all your employees' goals, something changes. Mm -hmm. You rip people out of the past and into today. That's different, right? Your dress code is different. Your employees all came to greet me. Like they're all friendly. They're all like, you have a very strong culture. Now you haven't maybe defined it yet to be able to articulate it yet, but you have a culture story, mm -hmm. okay? Um, have you ever really come close to failure? 
Yeah. <laughs> Probably a couple, right? A lot. Where the business was, so I call it the lesson from the edge. Yep. Do you have a lesson from the edge story? Yep. That's another hero's journey where you talk about the the, 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 the mistake that you made, and especially if the if the the lesson from the edge is because you screwed up. Yep. Right. Like I had a couple of screw ups that were so big that I almost lo- we almost lost one eight hundred got junk. Wow. Brian and I weren't listening to our VP of finance. He was telling us to be careful, but he was very quiet, very amiable, very analytical, and we're like, yeah, yeah, we got so it. So it didn't seem dangerous didn't seem dangerous and we were like, no, we were such strong drivers that we would just drive right over top of them until we let him go. We hired a new CFO to come in over top of him. She was very strong, very seasoned, the former CFO for business objects. And she came in and she literally kind of rang the fire alarm and said, we're out of money in two weeks. Brian had to go borrow 400,000 from his mom to meet payroll. We had to fire a bunch of people. The lesson there was if you're hiring people, you have to listen to them. You can't you can't just keep steamrolling. Otherwise, what are they there for in the first place? Right. But we almost lost the company. So I could tell a whole story about listening to executives and, and how to give them the room in the meetings to be able to do that and how to get their voices heard in meetings and how to, um, how to make sure you include that in your hiring process and, and how to control the dominant expressive people who won't shut up. There's a story there, right? right? So what you do is you come up with five stories about your company and then you have five bullet points that describe each story. That's all you need okay. to make a phone call. Really? That's it. You That's phone true. a journalist and say, hey, I have a good story for you. Do you have a couple minutes? Sure, what is it? I want to talk to you about this time where I almost lost the company when I heard it got junk. I almost blew it up. What, what happened? Well, I wasn't. And then, and then I weave in about meetings suck. And I weave in about my book, Meetings Suck. And I talk about how meetings suck can help them. All of a sudden, the story is really about my book, Meetings Suck. But the story angle is about from, you know, from trash to cash and almost back to trash. Or from cash almost back to, back to trash, right? So in, in this case, I've got Kelsey, right? Yeah. And Kelsey usually will do the reach out. She reached out to you. We're, yeah. You're here because of Kelsey. If Kelsey's right? good at picking up the phone, right? If Kelsey, if Kelsey can handle rejection. So I hire 23 to 27 year old female salespeople who are okay with cold calling and who can handle rejection. Often people are good at handling rejection over email, but they don't like it verbally. So I'll give you an example. I phoned a guy, Tom Cohen, who is the Canadian bureau chief from Associated Press. Mm -hmm. So he's like the biggest guy in the entire country for Associated Press. I phone, I pick up the phone. Hey, Tom, it's Cameron Harold calling. I have a good story for you. Do you have two minutes? Nope, I'm busy. A marketing person would be like, oh my God, he hung up on me. I was like, shit, I have the right number. Right, right. Right? I call him two days later. Hey, Tom, it's Cameron calling. You know, uh, I've got a good story. I'm really busy. Boom. Third time. I told you I'm busy. Boom. Fourth time. Like, I'm busy working on this Gulf War thing. Boom. Doesn't matter. I sent emails, I picked up the phone, 17 touches. Three months later, I get a phone call. 17 touches in what time frame? Over about six weeks. I pick up the phone and a guy goes, hey Cameron, it's Tom Cohen calling, I've got some time. What's this story you've got for me? I felt like going, I'm really busy. <laughs> Hang up, right? But, but I, I, I told him, anyway, he, he covered us. We ended up in 170 newspapers on one day. Wow. But that's a salesperson to go 17 times on the rejection. A marketing person might go three, an admin might go two or three. A salesperson is going, he keeps taking my call, he hasn't blocked me, I know he lives there, and I know what I'm selling is good. So tell me what you think about this. This is something that we started doing about a month and a half ago, two months ago, where we do sales training every morning for an hour. Wow, awesome. And uh, now we don't do it with the entire company, we do it with about more than half of them. I say that you train all employees 15 minutes a day and one hour a week. One hour a week, yeah. okay. 15 minutes every day Well, the way we do it is we have, we go through video, sales yeah. training videos through the Grant Cardone like sure. system. And a lot of that is on mindset and rejection and like, you know, burning yeah, through it and all and that. Pro- yeah. So t- first 20 minutes is uh, watching the videos. Next 20 minutes is discussion. What do we take away? Because everyone kind of took something di- Great, a little different totally. away. Yep. And the last 20 minutes is role playing in that scenario. So you need four things to learn. <laughs> you need the abstract conceptualization, which is watching a video. You're learning in the abstract. You need the active experimentation, which is the role playing, the practicing. You need the concrete experience, go away and do it, right? And then you need the reflective observation, what did you learn from that? When you include those four things in learning, like your sales program, it really goes powerful. The third, second part is you need to make sure that you include audio, video, video, and kinesthetic. Some people learn by watching, some learn by listening, some learn by doing. Mm -hmm. That's pretty interesting. You include those three and four things, you win. This is how we built 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Like how I build every company Mm -hmm. is I understand the core underlying and how to keep it really simple. Okay. Right? I was the dumb kid in school, right? I found all the cheat sheets. 
But I look at entrepreneurs, everyone's like a fly. You're all trying to get out this window, bang harder, bang harder. There's a door, just go out that way. <laughs> yeah. Like I gave all my tips away in Double Double, the Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs. I like try to push it all in there. So you got you got a couple books. So Double Double's a big book. There's I know a lot of people that read now, Double yeah. Double. I haven't gotten to that yet. I own it, you haven't gotten to it. I've read Meeting Suck. Meeting Suck's great, right? Meeting Sucks double, doesn't for, suck. For Double <laughs> Double, read chapters one, two, four, six, and 12. I'm gonna read the whole book, so well, I'm not even gonna write It's not that. a novel, this is not Fifty Shades of Grey. You don't have to read it cover to cover, <laughs> right? Well, you should, right, so I, read me, all so three. I read all three Fifty Shades of Grey, it's a great So part. double, double, so what, what are the chapters? Uh, one, two, four, six, and 12. You got it. Okay. okay. Now, then if you wanna read a couple other chapters, you can, but you don't have to read it cover to cover, okay? Okay, well, I'll read, I'll read that before I see Yeah, read Vegas those five and then decide where to go. Okay, yeah, yeah, cool, perfect. I'll yeah. read it and we'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay, so, I, I want to take a step back though because what I, I want to make sure that I, as well as anybody listening, really understands because you didn't pitch to a guy that writes a blog. You pitched to a guy that got you in 126 newspapers. I've called bloggers. Yeah, but, but I want to go into that. Guy, he, he got you in 126 newspapers. Yeah. Who is this guy and what is that guy? What's his title? Where does he work? Because I'd rather have Kelsey on, reach out to that so guy. So here's how. If you look at a newspaper, you go grab the physical print edition of a newspaper, you see the author of an article, Beside a lot, of the, a lot of the author's names will be two or three letters in brackets. It'll be AP, it stands for Associated Press. Okay. It'll be DJ, which stands for Dow Jones Newswire. Okay. It'll be WSJ, which is Wall Street Journal Newswire. It'll be um, CN or CP, which is Canadian Press. So there's all these wires. You'll see that as kind of like a credit. Mm -hmm. That means that that story has been syndicated into multiple papers. I would rather phone that journalist knowing sure. he's on a syndication group then phone Bob, who always gets Bob's story, and it goes only Bob. Right, and right? you don't so you don't know leverage. what you don't know. I, I you're I'm thinking you got to reach out to 126 people. I want I want leverage, so I want to know the person who knows everybody, or know the person who everybody has their stories already. Wow, right, that's amazing. Okay, so radio shows, same thing. You get a radio show that syndicates. They made a sale. Nice. You get a syndicated <laughs> radio show. We're working at this podcast. I love it when it makes sales and companies ring. That, that's culture. <laughs> so the um, yeah, you, you want to find syndication. You want to find you know leverage. The next part is that whenever you get press, whether it's print or radio or TV, get a copy of that. If it's a PDF or online or video, whatever, get a copy of it and then push it out on the social feeds. Three times on Facebook over the next three months, five times on LinkedIn over the next three months, five times on Twitter over the next three months. Share it on Dig, Reddit, and StumbleUpon. Wow. Do you ever uh, and send it to your email list? Do you ever run ads on LinkedIn on your, like, and put it on your website so you get the reverse SEO? But you, so each story, if you look like at Like in my, a blog, on your website, like in a blog? No, I have a press area. Like if oh, you, you have look a at press my website, media or something yeah, like that. I've been in American Airlines Magazine, Forbes, the physical print edition of Forbes, physical print edition of Fortune Me. Like if you go on my press area, you'll see all the old press using this system. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we've got some good stuff too. Uh, but not like what you're talking about, but I, I definitely want to see how we can create that as well. Okay, so, man, this is awesome. Lots to cover, right? This is awesome. I, I feel like... Uh, I feel like this should be a pod. Like we, I should just have a podcast called Mike Asks Cameron Questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like a 86 episode. Right. Okay, okay. So let's go back. So Double Double is a great book. I'm going to read definitely at least those chapters, 1, 2, 4, 6, 12, before I see you uh, in Vegas. Um, you've also wrote Meeting Suck. And what you had recommended to me is, because I read it, my operations guy read it, but you recommend everybody on the team, every yeah, employee, every employee reads it. Every Why company. is that? Because everyone's <laughs> complaining about meetings, but they don't know how to run them. They don't know how to show up at them. They don't know how to participate in them. So of course they're gonna complain. So Meeting Suck is written, it's a quick read. Meeting Suck is written, so a third of the book is how to run meetings. A third of the book is how to show up and participate and be an attendee yeah. at a meeting. And a third of the book is what meetings you need to run to build a highly successful company. Okay. So when employees read that, they get it from a deeper level. Here's the second part. Most employees spend one to two hours a day in meetings. A meeting is any time two or more people are on a phone call, a video call, or face-to-face. -face. So if, if employees are spending one-eighth to two-eighths of their time, or 12 to 25% of their day in meetings and they don't know how to run them, you're spending on average ten to $20,000 a year for them to go to one, spend 15 bucks so they actually could do something while sure, they're there. Sure. Like it's financially irresponsible not to. Right, and, and in your book it was interesting because the title is Tricky, which is, that's great, that's great, like just a great capture in itself, but because you recommend, you don't recommend don't do meetings. You actually recommend do more of them, more, well, but structured. Not more. Do, well, more, more than what shorter. the average person yeah, does. Yes, I don't want. So I actually, Elon Musk did this publicly about three months ago. He went out and said, if you're in a bad meeting, walk away from it. I sent him a text. I'm like, no, you don't walk away from it. You're not fixing the root problem. If they just walk out of bad meetings, you're not fixing the problem. Fix the meetings and they don't have to walk out of them. Right. It's like saying, if you're in a Tesla and it goes skidding off the road, just don't drive in the Tesla. You wouldn't do that. You'd fix the. 
Tesla. <laughs> right. Fixed right. meetings. That's cool. Okay. And then it's easy because I've been in really great meetings. And what are your other two books? Uh, yeah, four, right? Yeah, so Double Double, Meetings Suck, Vivid Vision, Vivid which Vision. is my newest one. And that's all on, on how to articulate and get the vision in your mind as an entrepreneur out as a four page document that you share with the entire world. So all your employees can read your mind, they can see the vision. That would be company. amazing because that's one of the hardest things for me. You know, and I, I think we finally well, got it. On what you're building, but I know, ex I see it like. Like I see it like I see this pen and paper in front of me. Right. I know exactly what I, but like describe, I feel like describing this, this pen and paper. This is covered me. Forbes magazine wrote about, and their print edition, a full page article about the Vivid Vision concept 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. Doug Ducey, the governor of California, called me in because he read about me in Forbes to find out how to clarify the vision for the state of California, or of uh, Arizona. Yeah, you, you've got to read Double Double, the first chapter, which covers Vivid Vision, and also the book Vivid Vision itself, if you really want to delve in. And then my last book was uh, The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs. And I co-authored that with Hal Elrod. We cover the Vivid Vision know, concept yeah. in there as well. That's really cool. It's the powerful, powerful tool. It's important because I think that's what I, I, I honestly I think I've lost people because of it. Um, just because you know, and every, you haven't attracted people because they weren't sure. And I haven't saw attracted today, people. but they didn't see two years out from now or three right. years out. Because because you know it just seems like I'm bouncing from thing to thing sometimes. But in reality, all these pieces play. They fit. Right. They all fit and they really do. And and there's people in the team that get it. And well, imagine if you were building a house. If you were building your dream home. Okay, and you were the only one that knew what it looked like. There'd be no blueprints because they couldn't figure out what they're building. So you'd say, build my dream home. They'd be showing up every day building something and you're like, they're not reading my mind. Well, show them. Show them what you want, then they can do the plan. Imagine if you had workers putting up cabinets. You're like, what are you doing? Why are you putting cabinets here? They're like, well, where were they supposed to be? Well, of course they're going there, but they can't read your mind. Yeah. So yeah. we do it in a house, right? We share our vision. We get the blueprints, the elevation drawings, and then we hire a bunch of workers and the workers never meet with you, the homeowner. All the workers do is follow the plan. By the way, the daily huddle that's happening right now is one of my concepts. It's yeah. covered in double double. I love this stuff too. And in meeting stuff. Now we do our daily huddles in the morning at eight o'clock. We do them at 11 o'clock or two o'clock. The you know, first I've point in the day when that. the energy level drops. So let me tell you what we do and like tell, me if the, tell me if this helps. Tell me if this, you think this helps energy they level. They start at 11 o'clock. Yeah, I know, I know. When so the we, used to do them, we used to do them at 11. And so here's what we did. Okay. Um, eight o'clock in the morning, everyone's got to be in the circle, standing meeting. Right. But the music's up, the yeah. music's blasting. We don't actually start our meeting until 8.06. Right. From eight o'clock to 8.05, we have a, a group of people, uh, like a little group of people, that actually both of them are part of it, where we know we're part of this group, and our job is to look for the people that are a little bit more introverted and like yeah. they're talking. So now for five minutes, we're talking about our day, the concert they went to last night, mm -hmm. you know, the, the family they got coming into town. And so the idea is we have to talk loud because the music's up yep. and we're, we're like, it's kind of funny sometimes. So you're driving energy. We're driving energy with it. And then at 8.06, we just like, we go, all right. So we start out with good morning, loud rumor. Welcome hey, to work. When your system is working, don't. <laughs> With it, so. Well, I know, but I, it may not be working as well. Everything works, like not everything works, but a lot of things that do work could work better. So I'm wondering, I like in the morning because I want to kick it off. Like I want to start at 8, 8, 8, 8, 15 when we're ready to go. Like so we're here's, ready. here's what I would suggest or what I, what I believe in is I don't try to motivate people. I hire motivated people. Okay. So I hire people who want to get in at 8 in the morning them. or earlier. And when they get in, they don't want to be at huddle. They want to be getting their shit done. So mm -hmm. they're coming in, they're digging in, they're working it hard. And around 11 o'clock, our body, regardless of whether we're a good person, bad person, a driver, or amiable, our body starts to slow down. The death slot, by the way, for a speaker is the second point, which is two in the afternoon on the third day of a conference. The reason it's the death slot. I got at 145 next Thursday. You're, you're <laughs> in the death. Well, if it's the third day of a conference, the reason it's a death day. slot is because well, everybody's, really the first day. It's everybody's first. been partying. Yep. So now they've had two nights of partying, they're tired, they're going home early for flights, they got their suitcases out back, you're, it's, and they're tired. Yeah. So we run daily huddle at 11 o'clock, I have another client who does it at 2 o'clock, and that's when it gets the energy back up. Not okay. for the people who, who aren't energetic, but for the human body that just needs a boost. Okay, we're going to have to talk about this. I'm gonna, okay. I want to see, or maybe like I send you a video of our, our normal daily huddle and see, um, but I get the whole midday thing. That's pretty good too. Shit, so many things, like so many angles yeah. to all this that so you, you gotta look so, at. So you obsess about the business of the GOAT, but also the business of digital marketing. Yeah. I obsess about the business of culture and scale. Right. So my entire world is, is this, mm -hmm. right? In fact, all the clients that I coach, I don't know anything about their product or service. I coach some of the biggest digital marketing agencies in the world. Do you know Elite SEM out of New York City? No. So I've coached them from about 40 people up to 330. 
Um, Acceleration wow. Partners, they're the, the biggest affiliate program. They manage Uber and Apple and Target's affiliate programs. I've met, coached them from 30 to 85 employees. I don't know anything about affiliate programs. I don't know anything about digital marketing. I know what pay-per-click is, but I couldn't manage a campaign if my life depended on it. Right, but right. to teach them how to scale from 40 to 180, sell the company, and now be at 330, I can do that. Well, business concepts are just, that's why Shark Tank, the guys can go into a business, they have Correct. no experience. They know the 90%. Know the business of business. Yeah, I, you need to know that 10%, I don't know, Correct. but I got the 90 that you're struggling yeah, with. Yeah, so I only work with companies that their product or service is doing well, and then I help them scale. So the reason I know that daily huddle works better in the midday versus the afternoon part is that's just based on a physiology. Okay. But I also suggest that iterate. So if it's working for you at 8 a.m., don't mess with it. Yeah. Maybe move it to 11 once it stops working at 8. Okay. Right? Okay. Don't, don't put that bad vibe on me. Don't, yeah. It's no never going to stop If working. it ain't broken, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so you got those books. I love it. Um, I'm actually, you know, it's kind of like anything else. Whenever you meet the author, you're like more excited to read the books. And so I'm actually really, really excited. Like I'm, I'm skipping the line. I've got like a list of oh, books because right. you know everyone recommends you something. Yeah. And and I, well, I, one of I'm in the follow. Just selected for MentorBox. Which one? Yours? Which? Oh, yeah. you had two, didn't you? I have one? two have been selected. What? Vivid Vision is going out the very first book of uh, this year. It's going out in October, and then the second one is going out, I believe, in February or April. Okay, cool. Quarter two or quarter three. So, you know, the cool thing is, like you said, you're, you're coaching all these guys one on one, or you've coached these guys one on one, but now you started doing two new things that I, I think is amazing. One is your podcast, yeah. and then the other one is your COO Alliance. So I want, I want you to quickly just describe to me what is the Second in Command podcast. By the way, everyone, I'm not saying this because he's here. I've been saying this to people. By the way, I know I've recruited people for you cool. for, for, for uh, Second in Command because I think it's a brilliant idea and concept. Everyone listening, if you own a business, you and at least your second in command, whoever your operations guy is, needs to listen to this. It's worth it, it's easy, you do while you're driving. Second in command's amazing, but I want you to tell them about the show. Sure, so, so the idea was, this, it's called the Second in Command podcast where we only interview the chief behind the chief. And the idea was this, let's say you had a husband and wife raising a family, and you asked the husband, how did you raise your family? What are your company's values? How did you grow your children the way you did? The husband would have a very, very true story. And then if you took the husband aside and you then interviewed the, the woman separately and she didn't hear the guy's answers and you said, how did you grow your family? How did you grow your, your kids to be so great? How did you incorporate core values? She would have her story and it would be very, very true. And the stories would be completely different, right? right? His side, her side, and somewhere in between is the truth. Now, it's not that they're lying, but they have very different perspectives of the same thing, sure. okay? So, um, so, that, so if you ask an entrepreneur, how did you grow your company? You have a very true story. Mm -hmm. Now, what's your second in command's name? Marjan, well, Rob. Rob, Rob yeah. So if I asked Rob, Rob, how did you grow the company? He would have a very different story from yours and both would be absolutely true. All, right. All of the podcasters that are out there that interview companies are typically interviewing the entrepreneur. I want the rest of the story. So yes, I want to hear from Kendra Scott with her amazing jewelry design. I've known Kendra since she was a million dollars. Now mm -hmm. she's about 300 million. But I want to know what Lon's side of the story is, as being her second in command from about 6 million to 300 million. Yes, I want to know Sarah Blakely's story with Spanx, but I also want to know her second in command story. I want to know Eric at 1-800-GOT-JUNK story, but I, or sorry, Brian, who's the CEO, but I actually interviewed Eric, who's the COO. So we interviewed the second in command for Shopify. We interviewed the second in command for Bumble. So we're interviewing. And it's probably easier to get those guys too, as far as well, scheduling goes, because everyone wants the first guy. They're excited about it because they have a story to tell <laughs> sure. that's very different, and and it needs to be heard. And it's also very beneficial to hear it because you start to understand the rest of the story. So that's the second in command podcast. Such a brilliant idea. Thank you. Is brilliant idea. I love Thanks. it. All right, and, and now you got the COO Alliance. Yeah, so the COO Alliance is um, the Chief Operating Officer Alliance. It's only for the second in command. Entrepreneurs are not allowed to join. <laughs> um, the so only cool. people who are allowed to join. So you, you can be a COO or a general manager, VP Ops. We have some that have the CEO title, but they report to the founder who's chairman. Okay. So as long as you're the second in command, you're allowed to be a member. Um, and now that's 20,000 a year to be a member, and we have five events a year here in Scottsdale. They pick three of the five to come to, um, and they're only meeting with COOs. Now we're also launching that as the COO Alliance City Forums, and we're launching in 30 cities over the next three years, and we're taking it down a level where you only need 20 employees and two million in revenue. It's $10,000 a year, and they go every other month, uh, so tw wow. six times a year. Are you ever planning on having like a conference? Well, like, well, like where it's like, hey, the 16 speakers are gonna go up, and they're gonna just give amazing TED Talks, or amazing like... So here's what's interesting around the COO Alliance. They don't want speakers because they can go to conferences all the time. What they really want is time to mentor and, and mastermind with each other. 
So they want to work through worksheets, talk to each other, present to each other. So at our events, they do presentations to the group on, their, on the areas they're strong. We do bring in one speaker per event, okay. um, but it's more of them learning, member to member learning, going through worksheets, sharing problems, helping each other solve problems. It's, it, that's where the real value for them, because there's no tribe for them. Right? Sure. So, so um, now we're running an event that's actually starting tomorrow. It's the only time we've invited the CEO to join, to come as well. So it's the CEO and the COO coming together and we have a, a marriage counselor who's one of the best in the world. She's been on Oprah. She's coming in. <laughs> we have a behavioral profile, Steve Sisler. He's coming in. He works with him on DISC and behavior profiles. Is so, he re related to Jesse? No, okay. Jesse Itzler. So, um, Itzler, Itzler. Yeah, this, okay. so, so this is um, a time where we're going to help strengthen the relationship. Very similar to like a husband and wife or partners in a marriage. Mm -hmm. you, you need to get both sides better communication, better trust, better openness, better vulnerability, better systems to actually stay together. Um, so we have this next two days is our CEO Alliance. The only time we've invited the CEO to come. That's so freaking yeah, cool. Yeah, it's cool. All right, so like, what what's a place I can go to to learn about all of it? Like, is all of this on your website, or do you have separate websites for all these things? No. So all of the books, so the four books um, are all available on Amazon, okay, Audible and iTunes. So Double Double Meeting Suck, The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs, and Vivid Vision, and then the COO Alliance is the main website that has all that material. Um, CameronHerald.com. There's copies of my speaking videos that people can download and watch. What do you think is the biggest challenge for that CEO, the second in command? What's like the biggest thing he's got to overcome? Yeah. Everyone that's, that's got their COOs listening or their second in commands listening because they're like, this is for you, this episode. So the biggest hurdle is that the COO's job is to make the CEO iconic. So our job is to make you look good. So the hard challenge for them is that means taking all the negative stuff off your plate and let them deal with it and giving you the power to roll out all the good stuff. So it's hard for them because they know they're doing it, but they have to give you the credit. That's one. Second one so is... So like a Wozniak in the jobs. Yeah, very similar. exactly. The next part is that trust, is how do you keep the trust so strong? So you need date night. You need time where it's one-on-one. -on -one. You need time to just go and disconnect together, time to meet off-site. That's really, really powerful. So Brian and I would go for runs twice a week. We'd go off-site on Thursday to work together with our laptops for three hours, just sit on couches so that we could talk or laugh or just get our work done. But time to just connect is powerful. And then the third is we need to have systems so that the COO can save the entrepreneur from themselves. Entrepreneurs tend to have a million good ideas and without a system to keep track of those ideas and green light, yellow light, red light and decide which ones to move forward on, the entrepreneur wants to start them all. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's in the absence of a system. So that's one of the biggest thing we teach all of our COO Alliance members and we talk about it on the Second in Command podcast is a way to help you be you and not say no to your ideas but take them and not start them all tomorrow, but have a method for starting every quarter. So it becomes a much more kind of systematic way to, to allow you to be you, but also to grow the company properly. Because you can't, you can't scale a company you're growing it the exact same way all the time. Yeah. You know, what got you to two million might get you to four, but it won't get you to eight, and it certainly won't get you to 16. Of course, you need right. totally different yeah. leadership. Right? Okay, so the people, that, you know, there's people that probably are like, super excited to get their, you know, second in commands, like listening to your stuff, following your stuff and your yeah. programs, all that. What about the people, the, there's gotta be people that are reluctant. Like, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. Cause there's, there's I know there's a lot of control sure. issues with a lot of first in commands. Mm -hmm. Is there ever reluctance of that first in command sending that second and they don't know what's going on until later? There's a little bit of worry, but more <laughs> often than not, they're just going to be the companies that are going to kind of run at 7% growth for the rest of their life. Yeah, yeah. Right? And that's fine. That's not who I work with, though. That's like cool. I, I want to work with, so my criteria is young, fun, entrepreneurial, high viral, high growth, pre-public. So if you want to scale, you have to be vulnerable. You have to surrender. You have to, I flip the org chart upside down. So I have the CEO at the bottom supporting the VPs, supporting the managers who support the customers. Everyone sees the vivid vision and you build your company inside the core purpose and the core values. That's really so cool. when, it, when an entrepreneur can realize they don't have to know how to do it, they don't have to tell people, they don't have to hold them accountable, when they can flip it and your entire role becomes supporting them, removing obstacles, growing them. You know, your job is to grow people. Right. That's it. And then remove their obstacles and get rid of the assholes. Your job becomes so simple. So hopefully people who are wondering or, or not sure. You say grow people, meaning developing grow their the skills. employees. Yep, grow their skills, grow their skills, grow their skills. And their confidence. You grow their skills, you grow their confidence. Grow their skills, grow their confidence. Grow their skills, grow their confidence. Would you guys say that's a big part of my day? Yeah? Good. If not, you got to let me know because apparently this is what I got to do more and that's more it. and more of. That's okay, it. cool. Right? A CEO's job is control culture, grow people, and control vision. All right, awesome. Um, I love that. Uh, last thing I want to ask you about, 
before I ask you about one thing that's off tangent, but I think the audience would love. Okay. But I want to ask you about your TED Talk, Raising Kids as Entrepreneurs. Um, what, what's the premise of that talk so people can go watch it? We'll show B-roll right now of it. Um, but like, tell me about Raising Kids as Entrepreneurs. Like, yeah. What does that mean to you? Well, it's interesting. So I was asked to do a TEDx talk years and years ago as they were just launching, and Simon Sinek and I were talking about what we should talk about. He was being asked to do one. I was being asked to do one. And I wanted to do one around the Vivid Vision concept. And Simon said, no, it has to be something that you're really passionate about, something that like that doesn't necessarily have to connect with your business for revenue. And I was like, you know what? I hate the school system. Like I'm so frustrated with having been told I was stupid and I didn't fit in and sit still and pay attention and be like everybody else and memorize stuff. And I hated it. And for, for 18 years, you think from kindergarten until I finished college or university, I was told I was only a C plus, a 62% student. That destroyed me. It destroyed my confidence. So I wanted to get out there and talk about these kids who didn't fit that system, but fit in another system, and we needed to hold it up and actually give it some, um, some credence and give it some praise, and that was to be entrepreneurial. Now, what's interesting is entrepreneurs have started to become cool in the last 10 years. I yeah, did, it's becoming I, like a cool thing correct. to do. I did my TEDx talk nine years ago. Being an entrepreneur when I grew up, it wasn't cool. No. You, you were told to, to not sell stuff and give away profit, and you were kind of an icky capitalist. In fact, mm -hmm. the only book that really ever had the entrepreneur as the hero up until around 2010 was Atlas Shrugged. Oh, Atlas Shrugged. Well, Rich Dad Poor Dad was called. Oh, a novel. novel. The only novel. novel. Got it. So when, when, when a novel comes, like Atlas Shrugged, the capitalist was the hero up yeah. until. But now the capitalist is becoming kind of cool. It's a small book. It's a really quick read. You get it done in 10 Atlas Shrugged? No, I'm kidding. The thing is Great like book. It's, three it's Bibles in one. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> Skip the radio speech. The rest of it's good. <laughs> but what I talk about in my, so in my TED talk, it's called Raising Entrepreneurs or Raising Kids as Entrepreneurs. It's on the main TED.com website. Um, I talk about the traits to look for. I talk about about 18 little business ventures I had when I was a child. Um, I talked about how I was groomed and, and raised, how I was raised as an entrepreneur. You know, the, my son is 11. Yeah. And he reminds me a lot of me in the school section of it. There's a lot of differences between he and I other areas, but he reminds me a lot of me, like the kid just doesn't want to, he, he has zero interest in homework, but he's very smart. You get him to talk about something he loves, the kid, will, he knows every angle, he knows all these things, and he like, like right now it's uh, Fortnite or Minecraft and all these things. Like he knows all the things, he knows how to find all the codes and how to do all these things that people just don't know how to do. Yet when it comes to school, like I can't get him to tell me the difference between ribosomes and libos limosomes, these two things that are defined right there. And he just has to remember those two things and we'll do the words 40 times and he still can't get the two right. Well, and our, <laughs> this is why our school system is so backwards. There's no reason to teach a kid how to memorize anything anymore. Right. Because it's all on Google. You don't need to remember. Yeah, or exactly. Or it's on the Khan Academy. Right. right. So what we need to do is teach them how to find the answer quickly. Right and how to validate the answer is correct. Right. So what I would be doing with kids is saying, every kid gets an A, all kids work together in groups of five or six, like we do in the business world, um, and, and it's, it's finding the answer, collaborating on that answer, and proving that answer is valid and correct. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to go to like the wrong website or something that's been snoped, right? Like, but that's all they need. Why are we forcing kids to memorize shit that's already, like they're, they're never gonna have to memorize. Right. Same with handwriting, like don't bother teaching handwriting anymore. Don't even teach them how to type. They learn how to type just by naturally working on a computer. Why don't we teach them now how to talk to a computer and how to computer dictation? How to use the tool that's going to help them the best, Correct. the best. And how to, how to think the way we need to think now to operate, how to work together as teams and collaborate. The school I system love that. Is so I never broken. thought about the memory And thing. why are we even teaching them on shit they don't want to learn about? If a kid wants to, to research computer games, let him spend a year studying computer games. Right. He'll be ex and teach about the math of computer games and the science behind computer games and the, the psychology behind computer games and the marketing of computer games. Kids would be so engaged. We're teaching about like the War of 1812 and Native Indians killing the Iroquois. Who cares? Some kids do, but that's it. Not very Not many. Not very man. many. No, I mean, my, my kid, he, he, he's into stuff like he was really into Henry Ford. He had to do a project on him. He loved Henry Ford. He loved learning about Walt Disney. Like yeah. he, so I got him. There's these really cool books. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they're called Who, Who Was Books. So there's, they take like a, they're like maybe 50 pages, little book, booklets, and they're about these amazing entrepreneurs or, or people. Cool. So you got people like, um, you know, uh, uh, Gandhi, you got like uh, Nelson Mandela, and then you got people like Obama, and you've got people like um, uh, Truman. Sure. It's, it's, it's amazing. So it's really cool, all these books. He's got 136 of them. He goes through three in a day, and he asks me to buy more on Amazon. Amazing. So he's into that, but the way they teach that. I think it's different. Like, you know, we got, I got to, I, I spent 20 minutes, 30 minutes with him 
to helping you memorize the difference between nucleus, nucleosis, nuclear membrane, and cell membrane, and like all these things that I don't, I don't remember. I couldn't describe to you because I haven't touched it since. We, right. Instead of saying, here's how to look it up, here's how to understand it, watch a video on it, talk about it, but not memorize stuff. Yeah. Memory doesn't do anything. That's There's amazing. No That's a really good concept. There's no point. Okay, cool. And then the last thing, this is off tangent, okay. but I, I love where we're going with the Elon Musk thing. I want to ask your perception of sure. this perspective. Well, give me your pen. My pen died. Yeah, yeah here you go. Note of these who was okay, so pen. you remember, uh, well, you don't remember this. Let's go, let's go back to a place we can't remember because we weren't there for it. Sure. You, you put the note on the pigeon's leg, you send the pigeon. Yep. Right? And then all of a sudden they start mail. And they're like, oh, wow, we don't need pigeons anymore. We can, like, mail stuff. Do you know that only 100 years ago, pigeons were being used in war? Still? 100 years ago. 100, 100 years, years ago, ago today, 1918, in the First World War, <laughs> pigeons were actually being used in the war. That's how fast technology is expanding. So think about that. So, so now they start, they do mail. And then after that, they're like, oh, we could email. Great. Wow, that's amazing. I can get you that letter right now. And they got text messaging, right? And you're like, wow, text messaging. And what Elon Musk was talking about with Neuralink is basically you are already a cyborg, it's just a detached computer mm -hmm. and making it all one. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, you and I, we can talk telepathically right now if we want to without these guys knowing what we're talking about, just be on our phones and right. I could be texting you back and forth. Correct. Have we been developing telepathic communication the entire time and not knowing it and we're one step away? Make that internal and as long as I got your number, we can send texts to and, each other and, and these guys have no idea. And that technology exists today already. <coughs> what you're talking about, the ability to actually send a message back and forth already exists. There's the, you can watch TED videos on the fact that you can actually send messages to another human being thought to thought. How? Because, the, because it's just data, it's ones and zeros. So they're now tapping into the brain and the data in the brain can actually be flipped. So there's TED talks on this. So here's, here's one that just happened last year. Do you know that you can actually fax blood to another person in another country? No. So what it does is it uses the same technology as blood or as, as fax. It digitizes the blood down to the, I think there's four or six chromosomes, four chromosomes, and then it digitizes it and it knows the pattern or the string to then send that pattern to another machine and then blood comes back out the other end. So if you need a blood transfusion in Denmark, <laughs> you can have the blood sent to you from New York City. Well, how City. are we having people that still... Because this is just being developed. It's oh, just, so it's not like approved fully yet? No, but eight that. years ago, you could digitally 3D print a human kidney. I, they were on stage. It, this is what why are you using? What's the year. material? Cells. Cells are no different than, than, than plastics. But why are we talking about the... Kardashians, excuse my language. No, so this is it's crazy. It's and if crazy. people don't think this is coming, it's coming faster than we think. I drove in the exponentially. Very, it's I not even. The first, well, I drove in the first uh, the the first Google experimental car in 2010, at TED in a parking lot. I have it on video on my phone. I can show it to you in a parking lot driving in it seven years ago. Now seven years later, I drove my car from Scottsdale to Vancouver, 2,400 miles. 2,000 of it, my car drove itself. And there was a bunch of time while we were driving, my girlfriend and I were making out because, <laughs> because the car beside me on the road was kind of freaked out and we thought, let's just make it even funnier for them. Let's <laughs> pretend we're not driving for three minutes just to freak them out. That's only in seven years. Right. That's incredible, man. Yeah. The stuff it's, is coming. It's nuts. And, and, and the cool thing too with Elon Musk thing is like now when, when it's all in your brain and all your thoughts, your memories, everything can be traced back. If, something, if you die, we could just ex download your person and export it and then import it into another thing and now we got you over here. So did you watch the TED talk from two years ago with Martine Rothblatt? No. So Martine Rothblatt is the, the highest paid female CEO in, the, in North America. She What's her name? Martine Rothblatt. She was the founder of Sirius Satellite Radio and then, well, she was a guy at that time. Her name was Martin Rothblatt. Oh, so, okay. So she yeah. transitioned to become Martine Rothblatt. She and it was founder of iHeartRadio? Sirius. Sirius Radio. So Sirius Satellite Radio, she now runs um, United, uh, United Therapeutics. She runs a couple of billion dollar companies. So she's creating AI and this robotics device of her wife that she's been married to the entire time since she was a man and now is a woman. I know her daughter Genesis in the Genius Network. They've created this technology now where they're downloading their minds, downloading their feelings, downloading all the DNA to be able to cryogenically freeze themselves and then in the future bring themselves back so they can be remarried but into an AI robotic kind of device. 
that TED talk with a physical what? with a physical robot <laughs> full face of her wife. It's this stuff is existing already, or but in the, the reason we don't know about it is because we're not we're spending, talking about right. it enough. Who won the but, Bears? But but meanwhile, everyone How knows the about play? the Bear game. They know every play, where the game was lost, all that. But meanwhile, I'm downloading my wife over here. I'm exporting this guy, and no one knows what right. the hell's going on. The, the average person is getting stupider, and the average intelligence level of computers in the world is growing exponentially. And when you think about it, we can get. Smarter if exponentially. The, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Right. Like, go to Abundance 360. Come to TED. Join the Genius Network. When we plug into these groups where we're no longer the smartest person in the room, our knowledge expands. You lift up. I call it ideas having sex. I take your idea, my idea, boom. They have a baby. They have a baby. <laughs> so, babies. You know, the crazy, we, we, should, we have all the resources to be intelligent faster right. than any other Facebook, era ever. Facebook is like an intelligence condom. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I, we can pick, we, I don't know how we can do B-roll of that. Yeah, how right. can we create a visual for the audience? Um, but I mean, we think about it like we don't have to waste bandwidth, brain bandwidth on stupid stuff anymore. Like remembering when the Spanish Armada took place. Who cares? There, no, I know. The point is no one cares. Right. But at one point it was taught to us and we had to use up bandwidth. Yeah. Now it's like, look, I don't even have to be able to do hard math anymore. I, all I need to know is how to use my mind and how to think and how to create. And if I could do that, right. all the other stuff, need, I, can, I can just retrieve anytime I want. We need to have to know that that kind of math can be done and how you might apply it, but then the computer right. can do how it How you can apply us. it and how you can get the solution. Correct. Man, I love talking to you. Thank you. This is fun. <laughs> well, guys, I got to wrap it up. Is there anything else? What, what, what do you want to talk? Like, is there anything these guys need to know about yeah. you? We talk about CEO Alliance. We talk about your four books, I'll your leave podcast. I'll one thing, and it's interesting, because they asked Elon when he was finishing with Joe Rogan, what's one thing? And he said, you know, people are good. Like, mm -hmm. people are good. But, and my one thing that I always finish with is, we shouldn't take any of this so f seriously. Mm -hmm. Like, this is just what we do to make money. Right. Right? Your business, my business, the, the people that are working with us on the podcast right now, like, anyone listening, like, this is just what you do to make money. Let's have some fun. Mm -hmm. Like hold hands when you cross the street, skip and dance, go do silly things. I think we have to let that 13 year old that's trapped inside of us out more because we're all going to die and we're all just walking each other home. That's pretty cool. That's awesome, man. I love it. This is a really, really great episode that I'm actually going to listen to as soon as it's uploaded in my car. I usually don't like listening to my own stuff because I already know what's coming. It's like watching a movie twice sometimes. But there's a few episodes that I definitely have listened to a few times, and I, I know this is going to be one of them. And Kelsey, I know you're going to be listening, especially to the PR section. This is your kind of this is your thing. I'll send you some stuff on PR that you can have too. I appreciate it, man. Hey, yeah. thank you so much you're for being on, and appreciate for everybody watching, everybody listening. It's been another episode of the Goat Show. Thank you, and we will see you next week. Bye, guys. Thanks for joining us today. If you like this episode, subscribe to our YouTube channel or find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts might be. And if you really like this episode, please leave a review for us on iTunes. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.